Good morning. My name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 7. We are wrapping up our study in the Sermon on the Mount. We have been in this most famous sermon of all time for uh, about 10 weeks. And as we get started this morning, I want to I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a position where you absolutely knew what someone else was supposed to do and they totally rejected your wisdom, your advice, your counsel. Anybody? Show of hands. Are we courageous? Okay. Okay. Well, I see parents' hands going up. That's funny to me. Um, so let me share, share a story with you. About five, probably more like six years ago, I went to a spin class at the gym that my wife and I belonged at at the time. And I got in, I got seated, and I started riding. And about a minute or two in, I quickly realized this bike is not set right. I am pedaling completely with my knees. I'm not using my quads. I'm not using my calves or my hips. Or like biking can be a full body exercise. It was all coming from my knees. But I didn't want to look foolish. I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to interrupt. So I just decided I'm in my early 30s. It's totally fine. I'll just, no big deal. Who cares about consequences? Carpe diem. And I just kept going. Fast forward to right now, this very moment. I have been dealing for the past six years with this chronic knee pain that as I've gotten older has just gotten more and more severe, more and more painful. And late last year, I kind of hit this breaking point where I realized I like the weird thing about whatever I've got going on in this knee is when I'm running or doing something physical and active, it doesn't hurt. But as soon as I stop, like towards the end of last year, I realized, wow, if I run on the treadmill and then get off the treadmill, once I kind of let my muscles cool down, I had no mobility in my knee for like the next two or three days. And I got to this point where I was like, I need to do, like, I I don't want to just deal with this for the rest of my life or until Jesus comes back, and clearly time and just persevering and gritting through it isn't going to solve this problem. So I had to humble myself and make an appointment with a physical therapist. And a couple of, uh, a couple of months, it, took, it only took me six years to get there. Um, and so uh, about five weeks ago, I started going to a physical therapist. And, and let me just share with, like, I am really good at going to my appointments. Show up on time, show up a little bit early every time. My, my bank card always goes through. I pay my bill really well. And while I'm there, I am an obedient little puppy. When he tells me to do exercises, I listen so good, you guys would be so proud of me. Here's where things break down. He gives me homework. And every time I go, he gives me like three or four new exercises that I'm supposed to implement. And Thursday, I was walking into my appointment, I'm going twice a week, and I found myself frustrated with my therapist, who, by the way, I've officially hit the age where my therapist is probably early 20s, and he's a kid. Like, I'm just, I'm there. I'm like, I'd probably get along better with your dad than with you. Uh, That's just where I'm at in my life, and that was a fun realization. But but this kid, who's my physical therapist, I was walking in super judgy, y'all. Like, I was like, this doesn't work. I'm paying a ton of money, and he's not fixing my problems. He's not making me any better. And I literally had this light bulb moment. that He's giving me all of these exercises to do when I go home. I'm supposed to do five sets of wall sits every single day. Guess how many wall sits I've done? <gasps> Zero. But when he asks, he's like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's great because I'm ignoring your advice 100% of the time at home. And then walking into your office going, this stuff, is, this stuff is bunk. It doesn't work because I'm not doing the work at home. I want the change without altering my behavior. I want to be made healthy without willing to make any sacrifices or changes to my daily habits and patterns. Here's my concern. I fear that some of us treat our spiritual lives exactly like my trips to the physical therapist. That we come here on Sunday morning and we hear the word of God. And this morning we're gonna hear a really pretty stern warning and, and, and some words from Jesus saying, if you come here and this is all the Jesus you get and then go home and the rest of your life is unchanged, it's really pretty scary. 
And we need to be cautious of those places where we're saying we're not willing to put the word of God into practice in our daily lives. And this is not a new struggle for just Redemption Church in 2023. This is something that God's people have wrestled with for generations upon generations. It's really hard to put our beliefs into practice or have our behaviors align with our beliefs. And so how I want to start our time together this morning is I want to give us a few moments to be still before the Lord and allow a very common passage that for God's people for centuries has lit a fire under them to remind them of the importance of not just knowing the word of God, but putting it in place in their daily lives. It's called the Shema out of Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to read it kind of over us and give us some time to just be still. And then I'm going to pray and we'll launch in to wrapping up this Sermon on the Mount But in Deuteronomy 6, Jesus says, or I'm sorry, Moses says to the people of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I just want us to take 30 seconds and just exhale and be still before the Lord. And then I'm gonna pray through this passage and we'll launch in. Jesus, I declare that you are mighty to save. And I thank you that you are our God, that you are one in three persons. God, we we, we come to you this morning in worship, confessing, Lord, that we need your spirit to fuel our love and passion for you. God, that we need your help to love you with our whole person. God, our heart, our soul, and our might. God, we acknowledge this morning that what we are going to walk through, God, are not suggestions or desires, Lord. They are commands from the King of Kings. And so, God, may they resonate on our heart. God, may we take your word seriously, so much so that it would alter how we live the rest of of today, God, that we would pass on a legacy of faith, Father, to our children, God, that it would be the things that we talk about, the things that we think about, Lord, that you would be the last thing that goes through our mind at the end of the day and the first affection on our heart when we wake up in the morning. God, I pray that they would be on our hands, Lord, that the work of our hands, God, the things that we look at, the things we allow into our home and the things that invade our culture, Lord, would resonate from your word. And so God, in this time, I pray that you would change our beliefs and that that would impact our behavior. Jesus, I praise you. I thank you. God, we want to give you glory, honor, and praise as the one who has done already what we cannot. Out of that, Lord, would we strive to bless your name and live obedient lives. It's in your mighty and glorious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we have been, or the last several weeks, we've, again, been in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. And last week, we saw Jeff kind of unpacking this compare and contrast teaching illustration that Jesus is doing, where he's giving us two gates, the wide and the narrow gate, and then two paths that, as he's urging them to beware of false prophets and be aware of the the fruit that is out there, the good fruit and the bad fruits, and then also the two different fates and the, the really like 
really scary and, and, and should kind of cause us to pause in our tracks that there are those who practice a spiritual type of life that doesn't lead to life-changing, life-saving relationship with Jesus that one day will stand before the king and hear, depart from me. I never knew you. That is a sobering reality, something that could, should cause each one of us to go to our journal or our prayer closet or a still and quiet place and go, Jesus, I need you. But Jesus has been comparing and contrasting, and today he's going to show us two responses as he draws this sermon that he would have probably traveled from village to village giving this, this kind of teaching as he took common passages, common problems, everyday situations, and he was making them about his kingdom and his glory and his purpose and calling people to a different way of living. We see that his word demands a response from us. And so this morning, I'm going to give us several questions that I want us to wrestle with this, this week. The first one is, do my beliefs match my behavior? Do my beliefs change my behavior? Do the things that I say I want to be about really inform the decisions that I make? And we actually could turn this question around and say, when you look at your behaviors, what does it say you really believe in? I want to challenge us to some self-examination, some, some introspection this week. But the, my fear is that we could be tempted this morning as we walk through a lot of examples and a lot of challenges as we're reminded of the commands of Jesus today, that we could be overwhelmed and unchanged. I do think one of the reasons, let's go back to my physical therapy for just a moment. I think one of the reasons... I am a miserable failure when it comes to my PT exercises at home is because every time I go, he gives me like four new exercises for five to 10 sets a day or whatever. And so my list is like massively long and I go, I can't, I'm just not even gonna try. It's too much. My fear is this morning, we try to take on too much and we go, we just, we just can't, we're done. And we leave unchanged. And so here's my hope this morning. Let's just focus on one thing. One thing that the Spirit of God kind of prompts you with as we remember some of the commands, as we look at the responses, um, as we really examine our lives. What's one thing this week that you can put in place? What's one habit or pattern or belief that needs to shift in your life? Just pick one. You don't need to pick seven or eight, nine, just one. But with that... Let's dive in to this wrapping up, these, these final words from Jesus in this sermon. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Jesus is again teaching using an example that would have been f familiar to his audience. This is a primarily Jewish audience and his disciples who are gathered. They have been anxiously awaiting a leader, a Messiah to come and rescue them. And what I think to them would have caught them off guard for us can maybe be a little easily lost. The first word in this sentence, everyone. The Greek word for this means all the ones, every single one, all of the ones, everybody, moms and dads, you, Jews and Gentiles, including you, kids and grandparents, that's including you, everyone, all the ones are able to hear and obey the word of God. For the Jewish audience that is gathered together listening to Jesus, they would have gone, wait, even the Gentiles? Yep, they're part of the everyone. That's, this is you and I this morning. We are those who have heard the words of Jesus. We now have the opportunity to obey his commands. We are part of the everyone. But they didn't, they didn't love this idea. 
They loved the idea of we are set apart. We are God's chosen special people that, that G- the Messiah was supposed to come and restore them to a place of prominence and power, free them from Roman oppression and Roman rule. And so the hope was that they would actually be in a position of authority again. And so they would have heard this and gone, I don't know that I like everyone being included in this blessing and this opportunity there, Jesus. Like, are you sure you got your facts straight? This would have been a hard thing for them to swallow, which makes me ask the question, are there people in my life that I struggle to pray for and believe that they really can be changed by Jesus? Are there people in that everyone that I just, and those could be people I know, those could be people I watch on TV, those could be people I just read about in the news, but are there people that I go, you know what, you've done too much for me to pray for you. I'm done. My concern, when that starts to well up in my heart, when I go, you know what, I'm just done even praying for you, even believing that change is possible, is I'm really maximizing their sin and minimizing my own. I'm saying your sin is so grievous, you have out the cross, which is not true. But I'm also minimizing my sin saying, well, I'm, I'm less wretched than you are. That's why Jesus was able to save me, which is also not true. We're just as wretched. Those, those people in our lives that we find ourselves struggling to pray for, struggling to believe that hope and rescue is possible, is a dangerous place for us to live in and leads into lots of possible temptation for bitterness, for anger, for resentment, for for walls to go up and hiding to occur. It is a dangerous place when we start believing that not everyone is possible to hear and obey. But that's where Jesus starts is everyone. All are welcome to hear the words of his. and, And then he says, Then who hear the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. If you highlight or underline in your Bibles, I would highlight that it's those who hear and do. That for Jesus, it's not enough to just come and listen and then leave unchanged. That does not make you wise. It is beliefs matched with behavior. But the temptation and the pull is always... Man, I want to do what I want. I, w- I want to hear the word, but I don't, I don't really, I want to go to my physical therapist and I just want him to fix me. I don't actually want to have to change anything about my daily routines, my habits, and my patterns. Which gives me another question for us to wrestle with. And do I spend more time in my week thinking about what I want or about what God's word requires, the way that I make decisions, the way that I walk through life and spend money or treat people or prioritize what I do with my day, how I handle stress and hard situations. Is it me navigating it? Or is it me going, God, what would you have me do in this moment? How, how does your word direct my steps? And this is hard. This is hard to do, but Jesus says if we want to live wise lives, we will hear the word of God and then put it into practice. We won't just go to therapy and say, fix me, make me better, and I'm going to ignore you the rest of the week. But rather, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to consider your ways. I'm going to come to you in all things. And for those who do that, he says, you're like a wise man who build your house on the rock. When we think of a rock, don't think of, don't think of Dwayne Johnson. That's not who I'm talking about. Um, think of a big, although he is a firm, steady, immovable foundation. The dude is a giant of a man. Um, but think of an immovable foundation, a secure and steady base, something you can set your life on that isn't going to be shaken. That is the imagery that Jesus is drawing here, that it is like building your house on a rock, a good foundation, because the problem is, um, I'm going to skip that question. He says in verse 25, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 
I love that here, I don't love, let me be, actually, let me be totally honest. I wish the way that this verse finished off was Jesus said, anyone who hears my word and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and then it was sunny and 70 and perfect bike riding weather all the time. That's how I wish this finished up. But that's not what the word of God says. That's not the promise we get from our savior. The promise we get is storms are coming. As obedient sons and daughters of the king, he says, when the rain falls and the winds come and the floods come, it's going to blow and beat on the house that is built on a firm foundation. But the promise is it's not going to fall. You're going to make it through because you're founded on the rock. Just looking around the room this morning, and just knowing what God is doing in our church family right now, there's a lot of storms raging in this room. There's a lot of really hard things happening here. And if we're founded on the rock, maybe the most life-giving, comforting thing you can hear this morning is you're gonna make it. You're gonna see it through. You may have some trees fall down. You may lose some gutters. Windows may shatter, but your house isn't going to fall because you're founded on Jesus. But the question I think we need to wrestle with just in moments of honesty, because we live in a culture that wants to pretend like everything is great all the time. We push all the junk into the corner and then we take an Instagram picture of the pretty part while ignoring the fact that the world behind us is on fire. Maybe we need to be honest with ourselves and say, man, I'm battling some storms right now and I need to invite some people in. I need to not pretend like everything is okay. I need to invite Jesus in to be my rock and then share with some of his people so that I'm not in this storm alone. But the promise we get here from Jesus is that storms are going to come. But the wise man who's built on a secure foundation on Jesus's word and is striving to practice as obediently as possible, those words and commands, he says, you're gonna make it through because you're wise and you're running to Jesus. But then he's going to contrast it. Again, we're in these two responses. He says, verse uh, 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Notice again, I think this probably made the crowd that is gathered listening to Jesus a little uncomfortable. Just like everyone is welcome to come and hear Jesus' words and respond in obedience, regardless of nationality, here, everyone is, it is possible for them to hear the words of God and decide to walk out unchanged, to walk out disobedient. It says, everyone, he says, who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. Or, as we've already asked the question, do my beliefs change my behavior? Is what you hear here, or in small group, or in Bible study, or wherever you're at, is it changing in your daily worship habits? Is it changing how you live the decisions you make? If it doesn't, the danger here is he's saying, you're You're not practicing. And and the reality, the analogy he uses is it's like building your house on the sand. And just, I can't speak. So we have a team teaching model. Like it's not one guy up here every week, every Sunday for 50 weeks a year. Um, That just sounds exhausting both for y'all and for us. And so I'm so thankful for plurality. I'm so thankful for a team teaching model. I don't, I can't speak to how the other guys uh, process comes to when it comes to preaching and preparing a sermon. But let me give you a little bit of insight into my world. When I'm preaching, one, it's my favorite thing that I get to do, but it's kind of always churning in the back of my mind. There's like, I'm just always kind of noodling around with the passage and dwelling and meditating and, and thinking about, could I share this story? Is there an analogy? Is there an illustration? Is there something here? Is there more to, like, it's just kind of always churning. Well, earlier this week, I was driving around and I was dwelling on this part of this passage. 
And I realized something about sand that I thought I knew. I had this moment of what felt like clarity. When I think, I think sand is just broken up pieces of rock. I went, ooh, that's cool. But I'm not sure. And as somebody who grew up in Florida, I'm a little embarrassed to say I wasn't 100% sure what sand was. And you guys know we have like a limited amount of time on this planet. And we only get one, one pass on this merry-go-round. I had to use some of my very limited time to go to my computer. And I am a little bit ashamed to say, if you went and looked at my history, you would see Nate Googled, what is sand? Yep, that's me. I had to look up what is sand. And it turns out I was right. Sand is crushed up and broken down rocks. So here's where this, this analogy that Jesus is using, this response to me, took on like a whole new layer of awesome. We could be wise and practice obedience to the word of God, and it is building on a secure rock, a firm foundation. Or we could be foolish this morning, leave here and put nothing into practice, and it's settling for crushed up, broken down, weak rocks insignificant rocks. The things the world lies to us and say, build your house and your life and your foundation on money, career, family, kids, marriage. All those things can be good and awesome blessings and are wonderful in the right context when on the rock. But when it becomes what your life is built on, it is nothing more than crushed up, broken down rocks. You're settling for sand when you have the rock available to you. Jesus says, don't build your house on the sand because the promise here, much like with the obedient, he says the rain is gonna come. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. Same storm, very different outcome. Same storms hit those who've built their, their lives on sand, but they don't make it through. Again, there are storms in this room this morning. And maybe you feel like you're not making it through because you've been building your lives on your portfolio and your retirement fund or man, the success of your kids. Please don't do that to your kids. Like that is just so devastating to make your kids your foundation and your rock, your successes live and die with them. Like don't do that to them. Maybe you're not going to make it through the storms because you've been building your life on the sand rather than being obedient to the Savior. And so for us, we, we're faced with then, okay, what is my response going to be? Am I going to build my life on the rock or am I going to build my life in the sand? And so what I want to do is that I want to go back through some of, we're going to pick five commands that I just prayed and the Lord laid on my heart. And we're going to look at what is a rock response? What is the rock command from Jesus that we are to leave here and put in practice? What is the temptation to slip into the sand? And then maybe one action for us is how can we pray if we're struggling in those sand pits, those moments where it's like, man, I'm, I'm, I really identify more with the sand. And so I, I just have to, I have to do this. I hang out with teenagers way too much. Um, so rock, sand, or pray to me, just like rock, paper, scissors. Like I can't not think about that. So here's my challenge. I want you to go home and have a rock, paper, scissors tournament this afternoon in your home, not because it has anything to do with the sermon, but if I say it to you right now, I stop thinking about rock, paper, scissors. And so we can move on in unity focused on Jesus, not on the game but you should totally play rock, paper, scissors. That's all. That has nothing to do with anything. Okay. First, if you're going to build your life on the rock, did you just win at rock, paper, scissors? That's awesome. My son dominates. Um, did you beat your brother? Oh, Sammy, that's fine. All right. Um, so if you're going to build your life on the rock, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter five, we're to let your life shine before men. And really the context here is that as our light shines before men, they see our good works and ultimately glorify the Father. That our light shines so that others can see Jesus more clearly and God is more glorified. But the command is to let our light shine. 
So your rock response, if you're going to walk in obedience, is to put your faith on display. But the temptation to build your life on the sand is to hide your faith. Or let me maybe ask you this question. Are there people, wherever you live, work, shop, eat, and play, that would be a little shocked to know that you're at church this morning? If they are or they would be, that probably means you have some sand tendencies when it comes to letting your light shine. If the way that you speak, the things that you value, the ways that you behave looks just like the world, you're not probably letting your light shine before men, before others. And so how would I encourage you to pray? I would encourage you to pray that Jesus would create a desire for you to hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, for they shall be satisfied. For each one of these, we're going to go back to the Beatitudes, the blessings that Jesus promises at the beginning of his sermon as as a prompt for prayer. But man, that Jesus would change you so that you hunger and thirst, you deeply desire his word, his righteousness, his ways. And you're not living for the approval of man. Secondly, and again, We're just picking one. As as we go through these, if one of these resonates with you, I just want you to focus on that this next week. Sanctification takes a lifetime. So as we go through, if one of these is just like, oh man, this needs to change in me, make that your one that you focus on. It says, be reconciled to your brother. When he's talking about anger and strife in relationship, he commands us to be reconciled, to do the hard work of living in community with each other to be willing to have tough conversations, to be willing to confront where necessary, to forgive where necessary, but to not just bail on community, but rather be reconciled, go in deep in relationship with each other. That's building your life on the rock. But the temptation for the sand here is to hold on to grudges, to avoid conflict, to the minute things get hard, you kind of wash your hands and run away. The minute I say something you don't like, you're like, I'm going to go find another church. I'm not going to be reconciled. I'm not going to fight for unity. I'm not going to press in. I'm going to go find somebody that's telling me what I want to hear. That's building your life on the sand. And so how would I encourage you to pray? Pray that God would make you poor in spirit. He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That you would be reminded of how desperate and needy you were, how much you've been forgiven. Because when you know how much you've been forgiven, it's easier to forgive. It's possible to forgive. Next, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, throw it away. This is, this is when Jesus is addressing the, the common problem and issue of lust through adultery and divorce. And he's, he's using hyperbole here. Don't let your one action to be go home and gouge out your eye this week. This is hyperbole. This is an illustration. Jesus is drawing extreme measures to show and highlight that when you build your life on the rock, you take purity seriously. You take seriously sexual sin specifically. That it does something to your soul. And so if you're going to build your life on the rock, you are going to take seriously matters of purity. And so that might mean you need a dumb phone, not a smartphone. Maybe you need to get rid of your iPad. Maybe you need to have a computer in a centralized location. Maybe you need to take extreme examples and invite in accountability people. Maybe there are extreme things that you need to do because purity matters. And where you're not standing on the rock when it comes to this issue, you slip into the sand where you feed your flesh and you treat people like objects. When you're clicking on those websites and you're looking at those things or you're lingering at the gym or wherever you live, work, shop, eat, and play, you're being extra flirtatious with a coworker, whatever it might be, you are not treating that soul like an image bearer. You are treating it like an object to feed your flesh. And it's dangerous when the storms come, it's gonna destroy everything in its wake. 
as the people of God who want to build our lives on the rock, we should live counterculturally. We should take this seriously. It is a daily moment by moment battle that will ruin lives if we don't take it seriously. So we must pray. Pray that God would make us pure in heart. Because here's the beautiful thing to me about this promise. Those who are pure in heart, what do they get to see? Not wicked images on a, on a computer screen. Not lingering eyes with a man or woman at the gym. What do they get to see? They get to see God. Do not settle for creation when God is begging you to see himself. Fix your eyes on Jesus, not on images. Jesus takes purity seriously as sons and daughters of the king who desire to build our lives on the rock, we should take matters of purity seriously. He also tells us in Matthew 6, do not be anxious about your life. I think it's interesting. If you go back and reread through that passage specifically, he tells us four times in one passage, do not be anxious do you think Jesus knew that anxiety was a real struggle for us? That was a real battle. If over and over again, he's like, hey, don't be anxious. Hey, don't be anxious. Hey, don't be anxious. I have a book that I got for Christmas that I can't fully recommend because I haven't read it yet. Um, so you can kind of maybe just discount everything I'm about to say. Um, but it's called The Infinite Game by a guy named Simon Sinek. And I listened to the TED, TED Talk. That's the same thing, right? Um, but he proposes in that, that so many of us treat life like it's got four quarters and an end. And you look at the score and you go, oh, that team won, that team lost, like a finite game. But that's not how life works. I think the temptation here when it comes to standing on the rock of not being anxious is we treat anxiety like it's a finite thing for us to conquer, overcome, and put in the rearview mirror. Here's what's beautiful to me about the command to not be anxious. You've got a moment right now to choose obedience, to not be anxious. Because like already, like I can kind of feel it in the room. You're like, I'm kind of anxious about being anxious. Well, pray through that and celebrate where you have victories, cling to grace where you have failures, and there's gonna be plenty of opportunities five minutes from now, seven minutes from now, 10 minutes from now. It is an infinite game. The game doesn't stop. Just because you had victory over anxiety this morning doesn't mean you're gonna have victory right now. And just because you failed yesterday doesn't mean you can't win today. It is an infinite game. You have opportunity after opportunity to practice the word of God, to walk out obedience. So when the winds come and the storms blow and life gets hard and your house is getting beat up, you can take a deep breath and say, I'm gonna choose not to be anxious. Even though I've been anxious all day long, right now I can make a decision as the spirit of God reminds you. So how would we pray? Pray that God would supernaturally give you the ability at the end of the Beatitudes, he says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You and I stand in a legacy of faith of men and women who took the words of God seriously and decided to suffer and endure and put their faith on display. And it's just simply our turn. And so yes, storms are hard, life is heavy, circumstances are tough, but we can rejoice. We can pray, God, would you give me joy? It is a fruit of the spirit that he will give to his kids as they strive to put the word of God into action. So pray that you would be full of joy, that it's just your turn to battle this storm. Lastly, last one we're gonna look at. Jesus said, judge not that you not be judged. When you build your life on the rock, you don't look down on other people. You don't walk into situations thinking you're, you're the answer man. You, you know everything that everybody is supposed to do, but rather with humility, with love and care for others, you recognize that, man, we're all at different points of maturity, different points of sanctification, and we can spur each other on. So he says, man, don't, don't judge. 
We have the ability to see and love and care for wherever the people around us are at that is building your life on the rock. But where we slip into building our lives on the sand is where we become, I don't think this is actually a word, but I say it a lot, where you become super judgy. And like, let's just be honest, like nobody likes being around that guy. When you think you have all the answers, you think you know the right way, you think you're the authority in all things, um, and you have the ability to speak down to everybody else, like that's not a guy I want to hang out with. And so how do we pray? Pray that God would make you a peacemaker, that you would be able to enter in and strive for unity, strive for love, strive for deep relationship, because he says that, for they shall be called sons of God. And so my hope is that we would focus on one thing to make our beliefs align with our behavior. Because the outcome we see as the people are hearing Jesus' words, and really this was one of the hopes as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount. He says in verse 28 and 29, Matthew writes, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribed. They were in awe of who Jesus was, of the authority that he had. He was unlike anything they had ever experienced. But here's what happens. There is a temptation to be overwhelmed and to be unchanged. As, as in the next several weeks, or in the next couple of weeks, as we get closer to Easter, we're gonna stay in Matthew and we're gonna pull out some stories of Jesus's life. And right now, everybody is really excited for the teachings of Jesus. But as his life and mission go on, as we see a savior on a mission over the next handful of weeks and we draw towards Easter, we're going to see people are going to become overwhelmed And they're going to leave unchanged. They're going to say, Jesus, this is a little bit more complicated than I'm willing to endure. And so I'm going to bounce. And my concern for us is that we do the same. And so here's, again, what I'd like us to do. I'd like us to focus this morning and this week on one thing. Maybe the one thing you need to focus on is your relationship with Christ? Is he really Lord of your life? Do you really believe that you are a total train wreck and Jesus took all of that on himself at the cross? That he is the savior that your soul so desperately needs? Maybe this week you need to go back and listen to Jeff's message last week and kind of the severity that awaits those of us who, no, we think we're good but you live an unchanged life. Maybe the one you need to focus on this week is Jesus. Maybe the one thing you need this week is a changed behavior. As we walked through some of those commands, maybe one stood out to you and you're like, I need, I need this to change this week so that my belief and my behaviors align. Or maybe one other opportunity is you need to form a new habit and I might've lost it from first service. Nope, it's right here. But um, for those of you who have daily worship habits that are just rocking and rolling on all cylinders, you're in the word, you're journaling, you're praying, you're memorizing scripture, you're praising throughout the day, like praise God, excel still more. Thank you. Keep pressing in, keep growing. If you find daily habits of worship really hard, we put together a reading plan for from now until Easter that's gonna keep us in Matthew, keep us swimming in Jesus' story as we're seeing a savior on a mission. And I would just encourage you, if this is a habit that you need to grow in, in just your time in the word, if this is the only time you have your tank filled, the only time you build your foundation on the rock, you're living in an awful lot of sand the rest of the week. And so this is available on the, in the back on the way out just to kind of fuel your faith to help you grow in a habit between now and Easter. I would encourage you to pick this up, but Jeff's also gonna come up here and give us one opportunity for us to maybe put into practice the word of God as we strive to align our beliefs and our behaviors.